Hope you're all doing well and can hear me okay. I know Mr. Greg can hear me this morning, so I'm glad about that. I got a big thumbs up. Praise the Lord for that. Welcome to Pine Forest. We're so glad you joined us, uh, whether in person or online. We're glad to be with you and that you're with us because uh, God will be with us where two or three are gathered. He is there. So praise the Lord for that. Just a couple of announcements for you. Uh, we will have our Ash Wednesday service on February the 17th. Uh, that is on the website in the Forester, and uh, we ask that people register for that simply because uh, we're offering several different options. Uh, we, are, we will have ashes available if you'd like to do it online from home. You can watch it the same way you do the service, and you can participate in the ashes um, and that ceremony and that special time of dedicating the Lenten season to the Lord. Uh, you can do that online as a family at home, and we'll provide the ashes for you. You'll just need a little bit of oil. Uh, not water, use oil, and to do the ashes on your head, and, and you can participate in the service, or you can do it online or in person. And so we'll have ashes available for that as well. Uh, so we are excited about that. That is February the 17th. Uh, so if you could register before that Sunday, before that Wednesday, that would help us out a lot. And then uh, the youth will be going on the ski trip. I'll be helping to lead that trip along with our interim Harley. Uh, so we're excited about that. I looked at the weather yesterday and it said one degree. So it will be cold, uh, very, very cold. Uh, there, another church went uh, this past weekend and they're on their way home today. So we'll be praying for them. There, it's Dudley Baptist uh, out in Dudley. But they had to delay their leaving this morning because of the amount of snow that they got last night. So I'm excited about that. Uh, so we can get some good skiing in and good fellowship and be praying for our travel and for safety. But even more, ski trip, we call it winter retreat because it's a, it's a, it's a retreat for the students to get away to experience God. So to make that your priority in prayer over this weekend is that these students will experience God on this retreat. Uh, I'm so excited that we could gather here today. May the Lord be with us um, as we worship. Let's stand together as we continue in our worship, our call to worship, as you re read responsibly, um, as we continue to bring forth the presence of our Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is a worship the King. Join us as we sing. hymn of praise this morning is when we all get to heaven. Have some victory to shout for in your life today. Let's continue our, in our service as we recite this historic confession of our Christian faith. We call it the Apostles' Creed. So today I ask you, church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Amen. There we are. Praise the Lord. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I have a few things that I want to uh, invite you to join us in praying for. Um, continue to pray for Pastor Wes and his recovery, um, that he will regain uh, strength in his feet. Um, we were told that he walked all the way down the wheelchair ramp and, and back with the assistance of his walker. So that is a praise that's a lot further than he was doing. So we're going to keep uh, praying for him. I can't imagine the... Uh, mindset of, of not being able to feel your feet and so let's just pray that the Lord will miraculously return that to him um, and he is still preaching the gospel he is still proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and so we're going to continue to celebrate with him on that continue to pray for Miss Susan as she's still recovering and rehabbing from the stroke that she had and so we'll continue to pray for her Miss Daphne Roberts um, I hate to say it, but passed away this past Friday and the service will be sometime in the month of February so just stay kind of tuned for that and be praying for the family. And then Calvin Sturgis's mom, um, Margie Cranford, passed away on um, Friday as well. And there will be a private service today for just the family. Uh, so be praying uh, for that family as well. And then continue to pray for Bill Harrell. He'll be going back in uh, for surgery on his knee Tuesday. Um, so he's had a lot of trouble with that thing. So let's just pray that the Lord would clear it up and heal him up. Um, so that he can continue to do the things that he has always loved to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your presence among us. We thank you that when we get to heaven, we will sing and shout. And Lord, we thank you for the reality that heaven is with us now. You are with us now. Your presence is among us, and we can sing and shout now too. Lord, we love you. We thank you for that. We just ask that this morning you would be glorified, you would be honored and magnified, and uh, we would see and hear things from you that would lead us uh, to hope, lead us to love, and lead us as citizens of the kingdom. Lord, we, we pray for those that we have mentioned this morning that you will be with them, you will guard them, you would give them joy and peace and comfort in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you so much. Bring us to unity as a church and as a family as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Standing on your word I'm calling heaven down to earth And you will fight my enemies And this will end my victory And I will believe it Yes, I will believe it You make mountains move you make giants fall and you use songs of praise to shake prison walls and i will speak to my fear and i will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now that you were faithful then You'll be faithful now And I know that I know You never fail Yes, I know that I know You never will And I know that I know You never fail Yes, I know that I know you never will you make mountains move you make giants fall and you use songs of praise to shake prison walls and i will speak to my fear and i will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then You'll be faithful now That you were faithful then You'll be faithful now Amen again. He was faithful then. He is faithful now. He is faithful always and forever. And we praise the Lord for that. We honor him this morning. I'm excited uh, for the message that the Lord has brought us to today for the uh, conversation that we've been having. Kim did a wonderful job last week of talking on repentance and teaching on repentance and what it looks like. And for some, repentance is uh, not something they want to hear about. For others, it's, it's a glorious thing. And I think when we see repentance as a glorious thing, it it is a uh, evidence that there. The Lord is with us and repentance lead us, leads us closer to the Lord. And so we celebrate the gift of repentance. And I thought Kim did a wonderful uh, job last week with that. We, we felt led to this passage from uh, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We've kind of been walking through the beginning of his ministry through this year. And uh, from epiphany to baptism to testing in the wilderness to uh, this message that he brought at the beginning to repent for the kingdom of God is near. And so we, we pray about and we talk through these things because honestly, without prayer, we don't really know what we're doing. We're just kind of trying to be obedient to the Lord. And uh, this is one of those topics where when you talk about it, it's like, okay, we got to really study and be uh, in prayer, fervently praying over this because we want to honor the Lord and what his message is for us. And we want to be obedient to that. Um, and repentance is the realization that through the kindness of God, that we have something in us that needs to be removed. And Kim did an excellent job of talking uh, through that last week. And this is the message that I heard that I really felt the Lord speaking to me uh, while she was teaching was, repentance doesn't just turn us away from something, but it turns us and leads us to something so much better. Repentance doesn't just turn us away from something, but it turns us towards something so much better. And that thing uh, is the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. When we repent, it gives us access to the kingdom of God. Or like Acts 3.19 that Kim quoted last week was that repentance leads to times of refreshing from the Holy Spirit. I want to be refreshed in the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to refresh me every day 
uh, to baptize me in the Spirit anew each and every day. Repentance, then, we recognize as our entry point into the kingdom of God. Repentance through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is our entry point into the kingdom of God. Jack Hafer would write this, There is no birth into the kingdom without renouncing your sin and turning from sin to Christ. There is no growth in the kingdom without obedience to Jesus' commands and the childlike faith of a disciple yielding to, the God, to God's word. There is no lifelong increase of fruit as a citizen of the kingdom without willingness to accept the Holy Spirit's continual correction and guidance. Without continuing in the refreshing power of the Holy Spirit each and every day as he makes us holy, as he sanctifies us. There is no birth into the kingdom without repentance. Repentance is our entry point into God's kingdom. So what is this kingdom that we talk about? What is this kingdom that Jesus spoke about so much? Where is it located? Why did he talk in terms of a kingdom? The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, the two terms are interchangeable, um, are actually the full gospel that Jesus proclaimed. The good news of the kingdom of God was the message that Jesus went around preaching. So when it said that he went preaching, he was preaching the good news of the kingdom of God that was near and that was at hand. Matthew 4.23 says, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Luke 8, 1 says, After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Jesus came proclaiming the good news, which we, we say as gospel, proclaiming the gospel, which means good news, and demonstrating that good news and establishing that good news that the kingdom of God was near and that the kingdom of God was on earth as it is in heaven, just like we pray all the time. And, you know, I would venture to join some others who have said that we don't talk about this kingdom enough. That we don't understand or talk about this kingdom, this full message of the gospel that the kingdom of God is near, nearly enough. Matt Chandler, who is a pastor in Texas, has said that he feels there is a lack of teaching or proclaiming or discussing this message that Jesus brought of the kingdom of God. It is a message and understanding of what God is doing on the earth that we must recover. He says that maybe it comes from fear of or maybe ignorance of the topic that we do not discuss it enough. So as a result of that, we've elevated the message of individual salvation, which is great. We celebrate individual salvation. It's our entry point into the kingdom. But there's so much more to what Jesus was proclaiming. There's so much more meaning to what Jesus was teaching and preaching about when he was traveling. He says it's not incorrect to proclaim individual salvation as a message of Jesus, but it is an incomplete description of what Jesus actually came to proclaim and to establish, which was the arrival of the kingdom of God. Meaning salvation is a part of the message of Jesus, but it is not the whole message. And we must recover that full message to really understand what it means and looks like to follow Jesus and be a citizen of his kingdom. To be a citizen of the kingdom, to be a child of God. The entire ministry of Jesus is understood in relation to the declaration of the presence of the kingdom of God. The entire ministry of Jesus is understood in relation to the declaration of the presence of the kingdom of God. The acts and deeds and teachings of Jesus only make sense in the larger context of proclaiming the kingdom. And that's why Jesus talked about it so much. Whenever he would go to a city, he would proclaim the kingdom of God. 
He would proclaim that God's kingdom was now on earth and among them that we must repent. We must repent for the kingdom is near. And that was the good news. That was the gospel that Jesus proclaimed. And we know that Paul warned all the time of hearing or teaching of a gospel that was not the gospel that we heard from the beginning. I've had the opportunity several times to teach a Bible study where I ask some basic questions. And I always do it really kind of out of uh, curiosity or wondering, but also just to redirect because I think that sometimes we as Christians think that we all have the same definition for certain words or terms and uh, we really don't. And semantics, uh, while they're trivial sometimes, they, they can mean more than we um, give them credit for. And one of the questions that I always start with when leading that study is, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? What is the good news of Jesus? And you would honestly be surprised at the different answers that I get when I ask that question. I would imagine that if I were to give you a sheet of paper and say, I want you to write in three words and sum up the message of Jesus or the gospel in three words, that most of us would put a different answer. That most of us would put an answer that is not what Jesus proclaimed, which was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. In the three or four places that I've led this Bible study, no one has ever said, the gospel, the good news, is the good news that the kingdom of God is now here among us. And I think it goes right to what Matt Chandler said that I uh, read to you earlier about we have elevated the message of individual salvation instead of seeing the story as a whole. The story as a whole and Jesus' fulfillment of that story. So why kingdom? Why did Jesus come to proclaim the kingdom of God? It starts in the beginning. It starts in the beginning. God made a covenant with Abraham to make him the father of many. Then you follow the story of Abraham and his descendants from that point, And you get to Isaac and Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God and was named Israel. He had 12 sons. Joseph was one of those sons. He had the coat of many colors. He had the visions and the dreams and the brothers sold him into slavery and he became a slave in Egypt. But God promoted him to the top of the kingdom. He was Pharaoh's right-hand man in Egypt. And he basically ruled over Egypt during the famine, during the, the success of, of Egypt in that time. Um, until a new Pharaoh came and established a new reign in Egypt. And then he put the Israelites into captivity. He put them into slavery. And then along comes Moses. And Moses has the burning bush. We know the experience. And God calls Moses to lead the people out of Egypt to the promised land. They get to the wilderness and they begin to sin and worship idols. And then they don't get to enter into the promised land. But the next generation does. God raises up Joshua and he leads them into the promised land. And Joshua, if you've ever read the story, I've been reading it, doing a, one of those read through the Bible in a year, and been reading Joshua this month and, or this week, and man, he was a warrior. He was, the, he was a commander of an army that was just incredible. They were conquering people left and right because they, were, they did not fear. They were courageous in their obedience to God. When they obeyed God, they had success. When they didn't, they failed. But then God would renew them and they would continue to conquer because he promised and made a covenant with them to establish them as a people in a place with a land. To establish a dwelling place for the people of God, for God's chosen people. Well, fast forward and then you get King Saul, the first king of Israel. The first king of the people of Israel. So Israel went from just having a dwelling place to a kingdom. And Saul was the king. And then we know he anointed the son of Jesse, David, unlikeliest of the sons, to be the next king. And we know that David was what? He was a man after God's own heart. You know, I've always tried to study and figure out, because I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to seek after God. I want to be, I want to please him in the best way that I can. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. But David was a man after God's own heart. He got it right. 
He understood what God's heart was. And I think I've kind of started to figure it out. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David becomes burdened to build a dwelling place for God. David becomes the king and he gets uh, burdened or overwhelmed that he is sleeping in a bed in a house. But God in the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, the dwelling place of God for the Israelite people in the Ark of the Covenant was outside in a tent. And David becomes overwhelmed by this. He says, I have a house, but you're in a tent. And he vows to the Lord to build him a dwelling place. In Psalm 132, we see the heart of David. And I would imagine that Solomon was writing this whenever uh, building the temple and remembering David as he did it. It says in Psalm 132, he swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord. A dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. David vowed to build a dwelling place for God because he was a man after God's own heart and he recognized God's longing to dwell with us. In the beginning, God was in the garden dwelling with them. He was with the Israelite people in the wilderness, moving to and fro. If you read the story in 2 Samuel, God says that he was a wanderer. And then David vowed to build a place for him, a dwelling place for him. And then he was called a man after God's own heart. And God promised David in that moment to establish his kingdom, his throne forever. That his lineage would remain on the throne forever. It says in 2 Samuel 7, The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. We know he's talking about Solomon who built the temple. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. And then later in verse 16, he says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. David was a man after God's own heart. He recognized that God was longing to dwell among them. To dwell among his people to establish rule and reign again on earth. Because we gave it over to the enemy. We gave it over to darkness. To sin, to death, to disease. And God longed to dwell among us to drive it out. And to establish a kingdom of righteousness. And in this passage, God is directly referring to Solomon, but oh, you can see the foreshadowing of Jesus. I will be his father and he will be my son. Fast forward the story. And Israel, the people of God, the kingdom of God that was on earth, his chosen people, they would sin. They would place things before God. They would be... in idolatrous people they would they would have idols before God in their midst they'd be a sinful people a rebellious people and they would end up in exile and then God would redeem them and then they'd sin again they end up in exile again and God would redeem them and this pattern happened over and over and over again but God was faithful to David because he was going to establish his throne forever then you get to the book of Isaiah the people are in exile And Isaiah is raised up by the Lord to be a voice for the Lord, to go. He says, here I am, send me. He was to go and to proclaim the kingdom of God that was to come and the hope of Jesus. If you've never read the book of Isaiah, I would encourage you to read it. It's it's probably one of my all-time favorite books. I don't know if we should actually have favorite books of the Bible. I don't know if that's proper. But this is one of my favorites. I love to read the book of Isaiah. The foretelling of Jesus coming in the midst of all of this chaos. And this is what Isaiah says of the kingdom that God would establish through the line of David, through the lineage of David. He says, in that day when the kingdom comes, in that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll 
And out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. That's Isaiah 29. Isaiah 35, he writes more. He says, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Then Isaiah 61, Jesus quoted this in Luke chapter 4, the beginning of his ministry. He says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God to comfort all who mourn. Isaiah foretells of this kingdom that is to come and this savior that is to come, this king that is to come and establish reign. But the reign that he was establishing was not the reign that they were looking for. He came and established a kingdom of light, a kingdom of love, a kingdom of healing, a kingdom that roots out injustice. He tells of the coming of Jesus. Fast forward to the first century Jewish people under the rule of the Romans, awaiting a king, awaiting to be redeemed from exile, from awaiting to be redeemed from captivity, awaiting a king to come and establish rule and reign that they had been wanting for such a long time. And then you have this man named John the Baptist who comes in the wilderness uh, preaching. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John came with a message that a king was on the way. John was the fulfillment of the prophecy of one in the wilderness who would prepare the way for the Lord, who would prepare the way for the king to come and establish his reign. And so John is saying, you must repent. You must turn from your wicked ways and be baptized to be made new. To be made whole for the kingdom of heaven is near. So you need to get ready and you need to repent. And he was talking about Jesus coming. In the beginning it was about dwelling. God was dwelling with them. He had rule and reign. He gave Adam and Eve rule and reign over the earth. They sinned and turned it over to the enemy. David was a man after God's own heart because he longed to establish a dwelling place for God. Because he understood God's longing for a dwelling place among us. And then Jesus came and he dwelt among us. God came in the flesh, fully God, fully man, and he dwelt among us to establish the kingdom. But he wasn't the king that they wanted. They had been in captivity for a long time under the rule and reign of the Romans and other empires for a long time, and they longed for a king who was a conqueror, who was militant, kind of like Joshua was. They longed for someone like Joshua to come in and establish a rule and a reign and take over and just be this mighty nation, this mighty kingdom that could have authority and dominion over the earth, that could dwell in the promised land without any kind of adversity without anyone coming against them they longed for the messiah the king to come in that way but jesus came as a baby he didn't come riding in on a big horse with a military to take over he came as a baby as an infant in a manger he came in humility he came in love he came in grace and mercy he came for the marginalized the poor the orphan and the widow came for the outcast and he came proclaiming the kingdom because that was what was promised was a kingdom 
and a king to dwell on the throne. A kingdom that would never fail. A king that would never fail. A kingdom that would reign in righteousness in justice, in peace, in holiness, but they missed it. They didn't see it because it wasn't what they wanted. How many times do we miss it or not see it because it's not what we want? Jesus embodied everything that Isaiah spoke of the kingdom. He was the fulfillment, the full fulfillment of everything that was ever prophesied about the coming kingdom of God. He fulfilled it all. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. And he did. When John the Baptist asked Jesus from prison, sent a messenger to ask him, are you the one who is to save us? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Lord? Are you the King? Jesus answered with this. Go back, and he answered and said to him, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear the dead are raised the poor have the gospel preached to them Jesus came to establish a dwelling place for God he came to establish the kingdom of God through righteousness he came to proclaim good news to the poor he came to open the gates of heaven and allow us to come in he came to give us forgiveness and grace and mercy and new life and righteousness peace and joy and love, all the things that we want to put, Jesus came to establish it. And he would proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. Repent and be baptized. Repent and turn from your sins and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is near. Kings have dominion and authority. The first century Jewish people were expecting a king to come and establish dominion and authority over all the others so that they could live under his rule and his reign. And Jesus did that. Just not the way that they anticipated him to do it. Jesus came and he just demonstrated dominion over sin through righteousness and over death, over disease, over sickness, over demons, over all that was not of God. He drove it out and he displayed his power and his authority over it because he has ultimate power and authority and he was righteous, he was holy and that's why he had to die. For without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. And the blood of the 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 animal, the ram, the goat, whatever it was, wasn't good enough. So Jesus came and poured out his righteous holy blood. And when he did that, That allowed for us to receive forgiveness because the shedding of blood is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. But then he went and descended into the depths to defeat Satan, taking all power. Satan's power and his authority was in sin and death, and Jesus didn't sin. And when he died, he defeated death. The grave could not hold him. It could not keep him. And so he had to raise from the dead. And when he did that, he stripped all power, all authority, anything from Satan. He stripped all dominion from Satan in that moment. Took it upon himself and established the kingdom of God. And that was the good news. That the kingdom of God was here and it was established. And righteousness and peace and justice and holiness were attainable. Through repentance. Repentance is our entry point into the kingdom of God. It's our entry point into righteousness and justice and peace and joy, love, all the fruits of the Spirit that we want to put. It was our entry point into the kingdom. When Jesus rose from the dead, it established the righteousness of God. It established the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. It established the dwelling place for God. Jesus came and dwelt among us, but when he rose from the dead and then he ascended into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit so that God could have a dwelling place on earth and the dwelling place is in us. Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could become the dwelling place of God. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is in you because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. If you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And everywhere you go, you take the kingdom with you and you establish it. And how do you establish it? You establish it in the same way that Jesus did. 
how did he respond when asked about the kingdom, if he was the one? He said, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. You want to establish the kingdom of God with you where you go, preach the good news to the poor. Set them free from sin and death. Bring them out of the real captivity of sin and death. And set them free to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. To come under the rule and reign and the authority of Jesus. Because that leads to everlasting life. And they can have the Holy Spirit inside of them. And they can become a citizen of the kingdom of God. They can become a carrier of the kingdom of God. This established kingdom of God established Jesus as the king. The ultimate power, the ultimate authority. You can't elect him, you can't impeach him, you can't do any of those things. He has ultimate power, ultimate authority, ultimate dominion. And as a citizen of his kingdom, you look to him. We look to him. We look to his power, his authority, his message of how to live and be a citizen of the kingdom. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus described what it was like to live underneath his rule, underneath his reign, of how to live. And that was the message that really started to set them off. Because this was not the king that they were looking for or the rule that they were looking for. See, in the kingdom of God, you can only humble yourselves, repent of your sins, ask for forgiveness, and become adopted into his family. But when you do that, you come underneath his dominion. You come underneath his rule and his reign. And you live the lifestyle that he called us to live. Which is to love our neighbor. To love our enemy. To preach the good news. To provide for the needy and the hungry. To give to the thirsty. To give clothes to the naked. He even says that if your enemy comes against you or someone comes against you to steal your cloak, you should give them your shirt as well. That's the kingdom of peace that Jesus came to establish. And that's the life that he's called us to. To unity, to love, to peace. Not to bickering or arguing or any of those things. He called us to live underneath his rule and reign of righteousness. And when you become a citizen of heaven, I think it's important for us to realize that the things that once held us captive, the addiction, the sin, the depression, the anxiety, the fear... All of that is gone. It's gone in the name of Jesus. It is gone. If the grave could not keep him and he established his kingdom and the kingdom is within you, then those things must go. Those things must leave because they can't be in the presence of Jesus. And praise God that he sends his Holy Spirit to remove it from us each and every time. Jesus established this way of living that he has called all who call upon him and become citizens of his kingdom to live. Like I said, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at that. We're going to talk about it. But go ahead and read it. Go ahead and read the Sermon on the Mount, beginning of Matthew, where Jesus lays out these different rules. And, you know, we were talking about it. You could honestly do a sermon over every single verse of that thing. You could do a sermon over every single verse. Because what Jesus said was so rich, but even more what he lived, what he's demonstrated was so rich. It was so beautiful. We find a lot about the rules of the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has called us to, that our King, Jesus, demands us to live. And when we leave that, when we live that life, we see heaven on earth. We see heaven in our life. Now, we don't fully understand the fullness of the kingdom. Because there is still sin, there is still darkness, there is still a battle that wages. You see, they didn't think Jesus was going to come to to fight a war, to fight a... Or they thought he would, but he didn't. I'm telling you, he did. His battle just wasn't against flesh and blood. He showed us how to fight. He showed us how to fight this battle that we're in that's not against flesh and blood. It's not to argue and bicker with one another. It's to go to battle with our spiritual weapons of prayer and of love and of peace. Jesus was a mighty warrior. He just wasn't the warrior that they wanted. And he warred against the things that really kept them captive. 
One way that we get to experience the kingdom of heaven on earth, God with us, is through communion. Through the sacrament of communion, we get to experience the kingdom of God with us. We get to experience the body and the blood of Jesus, which was shed for us. And Jesus, the king, and Paul, one of his apostles, lay some pretty strict rules for this, of how we are to live our life and how we are to partake of communion. A lot of the Israelites fault in the Old Testament was worship of other gods. It was idols. It was idolatry. They added things to God. They added things to their worship. Their focus was not upon God. And I would dare to say that there are many times that our focus is not upon the king. Our focus is not upon Jesus, that we put things before him. But when we become a citizen of heaven, we forfeit our right to follow or to worship or to be a citizen of anything else besides the kingdom of God. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven above being a citizen of anything else. And that includes our country. The phrase God and country does not belong in the kingdom of heaven. Because it's God and his kingdom and his king. He is on the throne. He has authority. God and kingdom belong in the same sentence, not God and country. Because his kingdom is eternal and Jesus is our king. He is our leader, no one else. No one else is worthy to open up the scroll at the end of the age. No one else is worthy other than Jesus. No one else defeated death, so we don't have to face it. Jesus demands all of his citizens, all the citizens of his kingdom. He demands all of you. He doesn't want a perfect version of you. He doesn't want any of those things. He just wants you. And he wants to dwell with you. He desires it and he deserves it. And Paul warns that when we partake of communion, we've got to recognize where our loyalty lies. We can't partake of the the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons or the world or idolatry or anything else. We can only partake of the cup of the Lord. So when we partake of communion, and we'll go through this liturgy here in a minute, there's an opportunity to repent For the kingdom of God is near. There's an opportunity to repent, to be made righteous and to be made whole so that when we partake, we partake in a way that is worthy of Jesus. And praise the Lord for his grace that he lets us do that. I think of the book of Acts when they withheld their offering from the Lord and he struck them down right at the altar. I tell you, if he was still doing that today, I would not be before you. But he has grace and mercy. And Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him. Who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And also with you. Our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made a new covenant with us by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to always be with us in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood for the new covenant, poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And in, so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Father God, we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So, if you have your cup, we're going to take the top layer off of the cup, and that's where we'll be able to access the little wafer. Save the wafer. If you don't have a cup and you want to raise your hand, our ushers are coming forward at this moment. Save your wafer, and we'll do it all at the same time. Once you get the wafer out, you can pull the juice part back. This is the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Father God, we just thank you for this moment where we can gather together at your table to remember the blessing and the love that you have poured out for us in the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we thank you for the, the fact that the kingdom of he heaven is at hand. Lord, that we are able to walk that out in everything that we do each and every day. Lord, we pray that you be with us as we move forward from this table. Go forth in the ministry of your word, Lord, and to carry that out into our week. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Service. Our hymn of invitation today is I am thine, O Lord. Please stand and join us as we sing.
May you go today as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with times of refreshing from the Holy Spirit walking in the power and the authority of Jesus, living out under the rule and the reign of, a, of Jesus with the joy of obedience. May you follow him today. May you go as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we also like to remind you our fellowship offering boxes in the front and the back. You can give online with our Give Plus app um, or, of course, send your tie to the church office. Join us as in our fellowship chorus as we depart today. Please be reminded if you could leave by a family gathering.